Hello, friends. My name is John the Baptist, and I'd like to share my story with you. It's a story of prophecy, faith, and the powerful calling to prepare the way for the Lord. Let's start from the beginning, shall we? Long before I was born, ancient prophets foretold my coming. In the book of Isaiah, it is written, A voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord, Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. This prophecy pointed directly to my mission, which was to prepare the people for the arrival of Jesus, the Messiah. Isaiah's words painted a vivid picture of my future role. Imagine a vast, empty desert, dry and barren. My job was to make a path through that wilderness, to clear the way for something much greater. It wasn't just about creating a physical path, but also about preparing people's hearts and minds for the coming of Jesus. Another prophet, Malachi, also spoke of me. He wrote, I will send my messenger, who will prepare the way before me. These words echoed Isaiah's prophecy, reinforcing the importance of my role. I was to be the messenger, the one who would announce the arrival of the Lord and call people to repentance. When I think about these prophecies, I feel incredibly humbled. The idea that God had a plan for me before I was even born is overwhelming. It's amazing to realize that my life was part of a larger divine plan. My mission was to prepare the way for Jesus, to make sure that the people were ready to receive him. I spent my days in the wilderness, calling out to anyone who would listen, urging them to repent and be baptized. I told them that the kingdom of heaven was near and that they needed to prepare their hearts for the Messiah. It was a challenging task, but knowing that I was fulfilling ancient prophecies gave me strength and purpose. These prophecies weren't just about predicting the future. They were a call to action. They set the stage for my ministry and gave me a clear direction. Every time I spoke to the crowds by the Jordan River, I was reminded that I was fulfilling God's promise, that I was the voice in the wilderness, preparing the way for the Lord. Reflecting on these prophecies, I am filled with gratitude. It's an incredible honor to have been chosen for such a vital role. My life and my work were not just random events. They were part of a divine plan that had been set in motion centuries before. The words of Isaiah and Malachi continue to resonate with me, reminding me of the profound purpose of my mission. Miraculous Birth My story began with an incredible miracle. My parents, Zechariah and Elizabeth, were both righteous and devout people. They followed God's commandments and lived blamelessly. However, they had one sorrow, they were old and had no children. In those days, being childless was often seen as a misfortune or even a disgrace, so they prayed earnestly for a child for many years. One day, while my father, Zechariah, was serving as a priest in the temple, something extraordinary happened. It was his turn to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. As he was performing his duties, an angel of the Lord named Gabriel appeared to him. Zechariah was startled and gripped with fear, but Gabriel reassured him, saying, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. Gabriel's message was astonishing. He told my father that I would be a joy and delight to them and that many would rejoice because of my birth. Gabriel also said that I would be great in the sight of the Lord and that I would be filled with the Holy Spirit even before I was born. I was destined to turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God and to prepare the people for the coming of the Messiah. You can imagine the amazement and joy my parents felt at hearing this news. However, my father's initial reaction was one of doubt. He asked the angel, How can I be sure of this? I am an old man, and my wife is well along in years. 
Because of his disbelief, Gabriel told him that he would be unable to speak until the day of my birth. Sure enough, my father was struck mute. But in time, everything the angel had said came to pass. My mother Elizabeth did conceive, and she kept herself in seclusion for five months, saying, The Lord has done this for me. In these days he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. When the time came for me to be born, there was great rejoicing. On the eighth day, as was the custom, they came to circumcise me, and they were going to name me after my father, Zechariah. But my mother spoke up and said, No, he is to be called John. The people were surprised and asked my father what he would like to name me. Since he still could not speak, he wrote on a tablet, His name is John. Immediately his speech was restored, and he began praising God. My birth was indeed miraculous and marked the beginning of my journey as a servant of God. My parents' faith and the fulfillment of Gabriel's prophecy were the first signs of the extraordinary path that lay ahead of me. My life was set apart from the very beginning, destined to play a crucial role in preparing the way for the Lord. Ascetic Lifestyle From a young age, it was clear that my life would be different from most. I felt a strong calling to live a life set apart, and this calling led me to the wilderness. The wilderness was a stark, rugged place, far removed from the comforts and distractions of society. It was here that I could fully devote myself to God and prepare for my mission. My clothing reflected my simple, austere lifestyle. I wore garments made of rough camel's hair, which were not comfortable, but durable and practical for my life in the wilderness. I fastened my clothes with a leather belt around my waist. This simple attire set me apart and reminded me daily of my commitment to my calling. My diet was equally simple and unconventional. I sustained myself on locusts and wild honey. Locusts were a common source of protein for those living in the desert, and wild honey provided the necessary sweetness and energy to keep me going. This diet may sound strange to many, but it was enough to sustain me and allowed me to focus on my spiritual mission rather than the pleasures of food. Living in the wilderness was not easy. The days were scorching hot and the nights were cold. The terrain was rough and there were constant dangers from wild animals and the harsh environment. Yet, this harsh and rugged existence was crucial for my preparation. It taught me resilience, self-discipline, and total dependence on God. In the solitude of the wilderness, I could hear God's voice more clearly. Away from the noise and distractions of the towns and cities, I spent my days in prayer and meditation. The quietness of the desert allowed me to connect deeply with God, to listen to His guidance, and to prepare myself to fulfill the prophecies spoken about me. I knew my mission was to prepare the way for the Lord, to make the people ready for the coming of the Messiah. This required intense spiritual focus and dedication. The wilderness became my, my training ground, where I could hone my spiritual senses and strengthen my resolve. It was here that I received the clarity and conviction needed to carry out my mission. Every day in the wilderness was a step closer to fulfilling my purpose. I embraced my life of simplicity and solitude, knowing that it was essential for the great task ahead. The isolation and hardships only deepened my faith and commitment to God. It was a life that many might find difficult to understand or endure, but for me, it was the path God had chosen, and I embraced it with all my heart. Baptism Ministry My ministry began by the flowing waters of the Jordan River, a place that would become central to my mission. 
Here, in this sacred and serene setting, I called people to repent and be baptized. The act of baptism was not just a ritual. It was a powerful symbol of spiritual cleansing and preparation for the coming of the Messiah. People from all walks of life came to the Jordan River to hear my message. They traveled from towns and villages, seeking something more than their everyday lives offered. They came with heavy hearts, burdened by their sins, and in need of hope. My words resonated with them because they spoke of a new beginning, a fresh start with God. As they gathered by the river, I spoke to them about repentance. I told them that to truly prepare for the Messiah, they needed to turn away from their sins and change their ways. Repentance wasn't just about feeling sorry for their wrongdoings. It was about making a complete turnaround, a transformation of the heart and mind. I baptized them in the Jordan River, immersing them in the water as a sign of their commitment to a new life. The water represented purification, washing away the old and making way for the new. It was a physical act that mirrored the inner cleansing they sought. As they rose from the water, they emerged renewed and ready to embrace God's coming kingdom. But my message went beyond the act of baptism. I told them, I baptize you with water for repentance. But after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. This was a prophecy of the one who was to come, Jesus, the Messiah. My baptism with water was just the beginning. The one who was coming would bring a far greater baptism, one of the Holy Spirit and fire, signifying a deeper, transformative, spiritual renewal. People were intrigued and moved by this message. They recognized the urgency and significance of what I was saying. Many were filled with hope and anticipation for the coming of the Messiah, understanding that my ministry was just a prelude to something much greater. The Jordan River became a place of transformation, where hearts were prepared and spirits were lifted. Day after day, more people came, drawn by the message of hope and the promise of a new beginning. The crowds grew, and the word spread throughout the land. My voice in the wilderness had become a beacon of light, guiding people towards repentance and readiness for the Messiah. It was a humbling experience to see so many lives changed, to witness the power of God's work through my ministry by the Jordan River. Preaching Repentance My message to the people was simple yet profound. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. These words carried immense weight and urgency. I wasn't just offering a suggestion. I was issuing a call to action. I urged everyone who would listen to turn away from their sins and prepare their hearts for the coming of the Lord. The arrival of the Messiah was imminent, and they needed to be ready. Repentance, I explained, was not merely about feeling guilty or regretful for past wrongdoings. It was about a complete change of direction, a transformation of heart and mind. To repent meant to turn away from sinful behaviors and to commit oneself fully to God's ways. It required humility, self-examination, and a genuine desire to change. This message wasn't always popular. Many people were comfortable in their ways and resistant to change. They didn't want to hear about their need for repentance or the consequences of their actions. But it was a necessary message. The kingdom of God was at hand and I needed to prepare them for it. The urgency of my message couldn't be overstated. I often addressed the crowds with challenging questions to make them reflect on their lives and their need for repentance. Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? I would ask. This question was meant to shake them out of complacency and make them realize the seriousness of their situation. 
I wanted them to understand that escaping God's judgment wasn't enough. They needed to truly change their ways. I also emphasized the importance of bearing fruit in keeping with repentance. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, I told them. This meant that their repentance had to be genuine and visible through their actions. It wasn't enough to merely say they were sorry for their sins. They needed to demonstrate their repentance by living righteous lives and doing good deeds. Their behavior needed to reflect the change in their hearts. In my sermons, I painted vivid pictures of what true repentance looked like. I spoke about the need for justice, kindness, and humility. I called out specific sins and wrongdoings, urging people to make amends and seek reconciliation. My words were often direct and uncompromising because the stakes were high. Despite the challenges and resistance, many people responded to my message. They came to the Jordan River, confessed their sins, and were baptized as a sign of their repentance. They understood that this was more than a ritual. It was a commitment to a new way of life. They were preparing themselves for the arrival of the Messiah and the establishment of God's kingdom. Every day, as I preached by the river, I could see the impact of my message. People were changing, their hearts were softening, and they were becoming ready for the Lord. It was a profound and humbling experience to witness the transformation in their lives, knowing that I was playing a part in God's great plan. My message of repentance was challenging, but it was also filled with hope and the promise of a new beginning, relation to Jesus. One of the most remarkable aspects of my story is my special relationship with Jesus. Our mothers, Elizabeth and Mary, were relatives which made Jesus and me connected even before birth. This connection was profound and filled with divine purpose. I remember the incredible story my mother Elizabeth told me many times. When Mary, who was already carrying Jesus, visited her, something miraculous happened. As soon as Mary greeted my mother, I leaped for joy inside her womb. Even though we were both unborn, I knew, in that mysterious and wonderful moment, that Jesus was the promised Messiah. This leap was not just a physical reaction, but a spiritual recognition of the Savior. My mother was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed, Blessed are you among women and blessed is the child you will bear. As we grew older, our paths were destined to cross again in a significant way. When the time came for Jesus to begin his public ministry, he came to me at the Jordan River to be baptized. This was a moment filled with immense meaning and humility. I had been preaching about repentance and baptizing people for the forgiveness of their sins. But when I saw Jesus approaching, I felt an overwhelming sense of unworthiness. I looked at him and said, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? It seemed so right that he should be the one baptizing me, not the other way around. Jesus, however, insisted. He replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. His words were clear and I understood that this was part of God's plan, a necessary step to fulfill divine righteousness. So, with a heart full of reverence and awe, I baptized Jesus. As he came up out of the water, an extraordinary event unfolded before our eyes. The heavens opened, and we saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. It was a beautiful and awe-inspiring sight, a clear sign of God's presence and favor. Then a voice from heaven declared, This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. This divine affirmation left no doubt about who Jesus was. It was a powerful confirmation of his identity and mission. For me, it was an unforgettable moment that solidified my role in preparing the way for him.
Baptizing Jesus was more than a ritual. It was a pivotal event that marked the beginning of his public ministry and the fulfillment of the prophecies. Throughout my ministry, I continued to point people to Jesus, reminding them that he was the one they had been waiting for. I often said, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. My joy and purpose were found in paving the way for him, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Reflecting on my relationship with Jesus fills me with profound gratitude and humility. From our miraculous prenatal connection to the moment I baptized him in the Jordan, every step of our journey together was orchestrated by God. It is a testament to his incredible plan and the deep bond that Jesus and I shared from the very beginning, confronting Herod. My commitment to truth and righteousness led me to confront King Herod. Herod had married Herodias, his brother's wife, which was against the law. I spoke out against this unlawful marriage, saying, it is not lawful for you to have her. My boldness in speaking the truth led to my imprisonment. While in prison, I had moments of doubt. I wondered if Jesus was truly the Messiah we had been waiting for. So I sent some of my disciples to ask him, are you the one who is to come? or should we expect someone else? Jesus responded by pointing to the miracles he was performing and the good news being preached to the poor. His reassurance strengthened my faith even in the darkest times. Doubts and Faith It's natural to have doubts, especially when faced with adversity. In my darkest hours, I questioned if I had done enough if I had truly prepared the way for the Messiah. But Jesus' words reminded me that God's plan was unfolding as it should. He said, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. These words were a balm to my soul, affirming that my mission was part of God's greater plan. Even though my journey was about to end, my faith was renewed. Legacy of Faith My life may have ended in martyrdom, but my legacy lives on. I was beheaded at the request of Herodias's daughter. After her dance pleased Herod but my message of repentance and the coming kingdom left a lasting impact. I prepared the way for Jesus, and through him, the world was changed forever. Jesus himself said of me, Truly I tell you, among those born of women there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. My role was to prepare the way, and I fulfilled it to the best of my ability. My life and ministry were a testament to the power of faith, repentance, and the incredible plans God has for each of us. And so, dear friends, that's my story. From a miraculous birth to a life of asceticism, from powerful preaching to a tragic end, my journey was one of unwavering faith and dedication to God's calling. I hope my story inspires you to seek God with all your heart, to repent, and to prepare yourselves for His kingdom. If you enjoyed this video and would like to hear more stories from the Bible, please subscribe to Celestial Chronicles. Share your thoughts and questions in the comments below. We love hearing from you and engaging in meaningful discussions. Thank you for joining me on this journey through my life. Until next time, may God bless you and keep you.